This is the Definitely Uncertain Podcast, brought to you by Gold Rock Capital. Each week, we look at how high net worth families can improve their lives, decisions, and investments in a deeply uncertain world. We always aim to provide practical information, even if we can't offer specific investment advice. This is the Definitely Uncertain Podcast. My name is Darren Rockman, and I'm a partner at Gold Rock Capital, the 21-year-old multifamily office servicing high net worth families in Israel and around the world. And the word on everybody's lips right now is inflation. We are now seeing for the very first time in as long as anybody can remember the resurgence uh, of inflation around the world. And to try and help us understand whether this is a temporary uh, phenomenon or something that's here to stay, uh, we've got Gary Kirk on the line from London. Hi, Gary. Hi. Um, very good afternoon to you, Darren. Good to speak good, to you. Good afternoon to you. Good, and thank you for joining uh, Definitely Uncertain. So Gary is a founding partner of 24 Asset Management, and uh, we also sits on the investment committee, and 24 Asset Management is a specialist uh, fixed income manager with £20 billion pounds under management. So a very serious player. We've known Gary uh, for many, many years and really respect his views. So we're glad uh, that you joined on the show. Um, so you know, inflation really has been persistently low ever since the 1990s. And it sort of bumped around the 2% mark uh, for you know as long as most people can remember. Let's just sort of look backwards. What have been the main drivers? Why has it been so persistently low over this period of time? Yeah, I, I mean, it's you're right. Inflation is obviously the key topic at the moment, um, which is good because I mean, you know, in, in years gone by, it's been deflation has been the actual sort of uh, one of the the key headwinds. But uh, now it's uh, I wouldn't say welcome to an old friend, but uh, inflation. <laughs> is and I, I guess you can almost cast your mind back to the end of the Cold War. You know, back in sort of 1990, 91. Uh, we had that brief flirtation with uh, some higher inflation at that time when rates spiked. But then from the mid-90s onwards, uh, there was the escalation in globalization. And I think that that was the real driver for, uh, you know, for an extended period of benign inflation that we've, uh, that we've experienced. You know, there's been a few hiccups along the way, but typically it's been driven not really just from globalization, um, you know, which obviously that sort of created sort of, you know, a mass movement of different people from lower income sort of parts of the world finding jobs. So that drove the overall uh, number of inflation down. But also, I think in the established economies, there was the deunionization. Um, that had a major driver as well, as well as, of course, you know, an aging population in the established economies, um, which was also, you know, pretty, pretty important. And um, and I guess obviously the one thing that we can't sort of uh, you know ignore is that increasing technology and the automation. I think all those things combined, you know, created this period of uh, you know of benign inflation that we've that we've come you know to get used to really over the last couple of decades. Right. So uh, a sort of combination of uh, cheap T-shirts from China, Margaret Thatcher, and personal computers. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Right. So, you know, when, when you look at that um, and then you look at how that's impacted the investment world. So what's been the impact on both fixed income, which is obviously your special specialty and equities? I mean, both have benefited from, you know, a period of stability. You know, I mean, you know, I, you can probably tell from the grey hair on the lines, you know, <laughs> you know, I was around. But for those listening to this on, on audio rather than video, I can confirm that there are grey hairs on lines. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I can remember, you know, pre the, uh, you know, that that sort of nine, late 1990s, you know, when, you know, inflation and markets were, were pretty volatile, the cycles were that much shorter but you know, since that sort of period of the late '90s, we've had a period of of stability, and that's really helped investors. Um, so I think fixed income, particularly as in the world of fixed income, the world of credit expanded during that time, particularly from the sort of uh, the late '90s onwards. Um, you know, that has been a very very good period for investors. You know, to um, to sort of participate with some degree of stability behind them. And likewise, equity, a period of, you know, low inflation means 
you know, historically lower than average um, sort of uh, base rates and, you know, and, and relatively stable curves as well. So they have all really contributed to a very, very healthy period for investors, you know, to sort of chart their way through the markets and, um, you know, and get fairly healthy um, total returns. Right. Not uh, a straight line, I mean, you know, but generally I'm talking about over the last couple of decades. Right. Right, with, with with the odd panic uh, in between. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now we're starting to see uh, the first potentially real signs of inflation in, in, in a very long time. Um, you know, I think that most of the guys trading or, or you know, people trading in bond uh, rooms have never seen an inflationary environment and don't know how to deal with it. Uh, certainly uh, you and I remember it. Um have conditions changed or is this some technical transitory phenomena just you know because of the way that you know inflation is measured uh in the economy yeah i mean it's it's the the, the trillion dollar question because really none of us know you know i mean if you listen to the fed they say it's transitory however i don't think even they really know how embedded in the economy you know are the changes that we've actually seen over the last 15 months Pre-credit, pre-COVID, sort of the pandemic, you know, the world was running very, very efficiently. You know, you know, and as you say, sort of inflation was running, you know, below the sort of the target level. However, there's been significant change. Um, I think both in the psychology, which I'll come from to sort of maybe later on, um, because I think it's important. Um, but also that the, the world has changed because of what happened during COVID with the lockdown and what happened to the supply chain. And it's the supply chain now that we, you know, that really has impacted inflation. And I guess that's where the Fed are saying that this is, we do expect to see um, higher inflation, but that inflation is transitory and it will subside over the course of the coming one, two years. The market is obviously a little bit more concerned. Is it more fundamentally baked into the economy? Only time will tell, I guess. Right. So give us a couple of examples, if you can, of where we're seeing this in the supply chain. Um, I mean, the, the classic case, I think it was in, I mean, the May um, inflation, U, US CPI year on year data came in at 5%, huge shock to the market. And, you know, temporary shock to the market. Though. It was a temporary shock to the market, or, or so the Fed says. Um, but we did. We we saw you know a ten basis point sort of a spike in the um, in the in the ten year treasury yield you know in, in, a, in a couple of hours uh, subsequent to that um, release. But when you start to look at it in a little bit more detail, a third of that number was purely down to the used car uh, market in the U.S. You know, used cars and trucks. I mean, right. which when you think about it, I mean that makes sense because if you've actually if you've been lucky enough to try and order a car over the last six months you'll know that there's a significant waiting list. And why is there a significant waiting list? A lot of the factories where they manufacture the cars were actually in part of the lockdown. They weren't actually operating for many months. And the supply chain that goes towards the, the, the parts to make those vehicles, there is still a backlog. And I think those two things combined led to a delay in the new issue in the new cars coming through. And therefore, there's been a spike in the used car prices where people have actually sort of gone to sort of you know, buy themselves a nearly new car as opposed to a new one. It, it's, a, it's a little strange phenomenon. It's just a little example of how the pandemic has actually impacted the wider economy. Right. Is that true also of materials pricing? You know, I, I had two meetings yesterday by chance, uh, both with people in the building uh, industry um, and building construction, in, uh, and they were both complaining about increases in raw, raw material costs. And there you're talking about, you know, cement and, 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 and pylons and toilet seats. You know, uh, is that also because of the lockdowns or is something else happened there? Absolutely. Um, you know, in fact, you know, my my niece is married to a builder, a classic uh -huh. small builder in the UK, um, you know, renovating houses, massive problem. The biggest problem he's got is not finding sort of, you know, sort of people to do the work. It's finding the actual materials, roofing tiles, cement, all of these has been a massive backlog and therefore the prices have gone up if you can buy them. A lot of the time you can't even source them. So, you know, this is... This is where I think the Fed are actually, you know, fairly comfortable in their, you know, continual rhetoric of saying, don't worry, it's only transitory. They're expecting, you know, normality to return. 
And the question is, will it return? Yeah. Right. Now, you, you mentioned before labour shortages, and that's some of the things we've been seeing around the world as people are still being paid to stay at home. Um, and, you know, restaurants, builders, uh, you know, the service industry are finding it difficult to get uh, workers back uh, into jobs. Is that also a factor here? It's a massive factor. I mean, you know, and I think that, you know, whereas, I mean, when you think of the couple of headlines that we've seen over the last uh, few months, Burger King in the States, you know, offering, uh, you know, a thousand dollar sort of sign on for new. Right, for delivery guys. <laughs> You know, and, and, and Amazon exactly the same. You know, these are, this is unprecedented. You know, yeah. I've never seen this in my work in life, uh, right. where you know, a, a kid flipping burgers will is actually actually offered a thousand dollars to come and start work. So. Yeah. Uh, that's you know, that, it, it reminds me of the 2002 joke, you know, after the, the dot-com crisis, you know, what do you say to a, uh, to a high-tech entrepreneur? You know, I'd like fries with that, please. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and I'm not quite sure we've gone exactly back to those days, but, I mean, it is, for those that have never seen it before, I mean, this is unprecedented, you know, paying, yeah. you know, sort of uh, real Blue collar workers, big sign on fees for uh, just for returns. But a lot of people don't want to come back to work. You know, the um, and, you know, a lot of people are still concerned about you know commuting in on public transport. You know, because sure. of you know the, the the other variants of the COVID that are coming around. Particularly, as you say, while they're still being paid by governments to stay at home. So um, I think it's a combination of feeling comfortable that you're still you know you've been at home with the family, not having to go into work. I think you've got to change people's psyche, you know, to actually sort of, you know, want to get back on that train and uh, to come in and, uh, you know, do an honest day's work for the, for the money. I think it's going to be an interesting few months, you know, that, that right. transition. So, so both of those factors that you've pointed to, uh, raw materials and the supply chain, and you know, getting through that backlog in orders, um, and the uh, people not going back to work because still either they're getting paid to stay at home, they're concerned to get onto public transport. Both of those would indicate transitory factors, which you know is in line with what the Fed's saying. But you mentioned an important word, uh, which I hadn't heard in the context of psychology of, of inflation uh, since. Uh, I studied it back in in Monash University, and uh, I'm scared to say this, but uh, 1989, 1989 um, which is psychology. So, where does that start to play a role? I think it plays a role. I mean, on on many factors. I think the people talk about money supply and the savings rate. You know, it's it's significantly higher now than it's been at any time in recent history. Right. Um, which is interesting in itself. Now I know that I know that this recovery has not been even, so not all parts of consumer, all, all sectors of consumers have benefited, but there have been a lot of consumers that have done. They've stayed at home, they've saved money, they've either been yep. paid to work at home, or they've had you know government assistance. Um, and that savings rate, a lot of people were saying, ah, you know, there's going to be huge, there's huge pent up demand. There's going to be a huge um, amount of consumer spending on the back of it. I just wonder whether the psychology of the uncertainty over the last 15 months, people will actually think, I've come through this relatively unscathed. I've got some savings. I'm going to keep those savings back for another rainy day. And we haven't yet seen the consumer spend like some economists were expecting it to happen. So it's an uncertainty, but I just think that people's psychology over the last 15 months would have been impacted by this pandemic you know which none of us have ever experienced before in our lives so right. yeah i think it's too early to see how the consumer is going to react when we do get back to you know the freedom that we all hope that you know will be uh, will be soon upon us right and, and another and another element of the psychology story is that one of the difficulties of getting out of a high inflationary environment once you're in it is that people start expecting inflation and that's self-reinforcing so, uh, you know yep. how close are we to that problem or is that still a long way off i personally i think that that's some way off um you know with with okay fine there's been some sort of obviously we've seen price increases in commodities but yep. people expect that to sort of you know to, to sort of you know come back down steady um the wage inflation has been sort of bubbling but you know i think a lot of the jobs that have been created because of the technology boom that we've, you know, experienced over the last sort of, te- particularly the last decade, um, but some of you could probably sort of cast your mind back, probably almost two decades now, 
I think that that has been deflationary in terms of wage inflation because a lot of the jobs being created are very low paid. We yep. talk about Burger King and uh, and the likes, but you know it's it's Wall. that it's a very very the, the differentiation between the highly paid and the you know the the, the masses um, at the coalface has never been greater, and um, so. You know that that's going to be an, another interesting factor going forward, which I think will probably pan out to be more right. deflationary than than inflationary. Right. And, and do you see differences between the United States, you know, in Europe, including uh, obviously the UK, where you are? Uh, there are some differences. I think really that just the sort of the momentum, the speed of the recovery is probably first and foremost. And we've we've had the added complexity here in the UK and Europe about you know because of the um, UK sort of you know sort of separating from the EU. So that's 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 obviously added a little bit more complexity there. Um, but I think overall, what, what happens in the United States, there will be contagion elsewhere in the established economies. So, um, so I, I can definitely see the, uh, the what what is reflected in the United States today will be reflected in Europe and the UK um, sort of tomorrow. Right. Okay. So we're at this uncertain point where we don't know how the inflation story plays out, and obviously it's it's very important for your business as a as a bond manager. So maybe if you can sketch us out two paths. A path where we sort of go back to that very benign 2% or so inflation environment and what you would do, what you, you know, you would do as an investor, what you would recommend people to think about. And then the other one, which is where you know in, inflation really takes hold and what you yeah. would do under those circumstances. The first or well, the starting point at the moment is, you know, inflation, whether it's transitory or fundamentally baked in, we don't know yet. And therefore, right. it's not a good bet at the moment to have your typical mix of the portfolio that you would have. Well, I would argue that at the moment we're in a uh, sort of uh, the, the medium growth phase of the cycle. But one thing that has been uh, absolutely sort of nailed on is that over the last two years, the speed of the cycle, the momentum of this cycle is so much quicker than, than previous ones. So I think we're moving to late cycle far quicker um, than in a, a, a typical cycle. So we would normally, in that situation, we want to have a balanced portfolio. We want to have a balance of um, credit risk, risk on, and balanced with some rates. Um, that's why we would normally government, start government, to, uh, uh, government bond, yeah, to move in. However, because of the uncertainty over where inflation is, is it going higher or not? I just think, well, we think that actually having the rates, the government bonds at this point in time is just not risk rewarded. So, I mean, we think that, you know, ultimately, if you look to see where inflation is currently um, being sort of uh, written, which is way above target, and target is typically, you know, sort of 2%. And inflation, if you look in Europe, if you look in, um, or in the UK, sorry, and in the US, it is way above target. So therefore, if you look at, take the United States, 10-year US Treasury bonds at 1.5% when the May CPI print was 5%, to us, that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether we think this is transitory or just some inflation built in, rates are going to go higher at some point in time. And I think right. you haven't stretch your imagination too far to think 10-year yields in the US are more likely to be closer to 2% than 1% um, by the end of the year. And of course, you know, as, as, as some background for those who don't follow the technicals of this, as uh, rates go up, if you're holding particularly government paper, you're, you're going to lose money. You're going to have a capital loss, exactly. So, so therefore, we we don't we don't propose to hold any duration sensitive bonds at this point in time. So, more sensitive to to rising um, government bond yields. So, the backdrop, though, you know, at the moment we've we've heard from the Fed, we, we, we've seen the, um, the 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 Fed dot plot charts. There's the expectations for the Fed members of where they see rates going. There's, there has been a significant change um, at the meeting just gone, whereby more Fed members are expecting now two rate increases by 2023. And that's a, that's right. a big jump. So they are right. becoming more hawkish. Until we've actually seen the Fed um, impose at least two of those rate hikes, 
we don't think that it is a smart move to be invested in government bonds at this time. You might get a few weeks and months where you're going to get some gains, but overall, probably not a good uh, sort of uh, position to be holding. We still like credit at, at this particular sort of point in time, but not credit that is sensitive to those changes in government bonds. So therefore, avoiding uh, long dated low yielding uh, corporate bonds, we prefer in to be shorter dated with an element of um, spread attached to them. So therefore, we're looking at just below investment grade um, at the shorter end. We think that that is the sweet spot um, over, the, over the coming year because of where rates are currently um, positioned, I anchored very low, and the, the fact that the support mechanisms, the asset purchase programs, et cetera, are still going to be in place through 2021 and probably well into 2022 at the earliest. So we right. still think that credit is the right place to be, but you have to be selective and you're better off being at the, at the in the middle of the curve, i.e. around the sort of the five-year or shorter. So five-year and the sort of best of the high-yield uh, companies. Exactly. Um, with, with, with the, with the, I, sus I suspect the logic behind that is in the investment-grade world, effectively, you're competing against massive stimulus money, uh, which is just pushing rates down there and making it very expensive, whereas exactly. in the high yield, you're not. And ultimately, the market will move before the central bank, and therefore, when government bonds begin to rise, which they will do, you, the, the contagion in those high, in, you know, sort of investment grade, long dated bonds will be most felt. Right, right. Uh, are you getting a bang for your buck um, in that area of sort of you know five year uh, high yield? Because you know they, that that part of the curve has seen a lot of spread compression as well. You know, rates there. You know, what what are you buying at today? It, it, it's absolutely. I mean, you know, that's. One of the problems in the fact that valuations look like they're already priced in, you know, everything that, you know, all the following wins that you could possibly that we've just mentioned. Um, I am, I do still take a degree of comfort in the expectation for the default rate, which is probably for, for this point in the cycle is as low as we've ever seen. Right. You know, the cost of mine back six months, the expectations were for six or seven percent default rate in the US, you know, five to six percent in Europe roll forward, the expectation now for the end of this year is probably nudging below 2% for both. Right. And, you know, right. that, is, that gives you a lot of comfort from a, uh, from a credit perspective, as well as the recovery rate. The recovery rate is so much better. So when companies do go into, go into default or restructuring, the recovery that the investor gets is that much greater than typically they have done in, in years gone by. So those are, there are sort of technical factors why we still like credit and why we believe that the, credit, the overall credit spreads, even though they're close to recent tights, we think that they're going to go through those and set new historical tights over the course of the next six, nine months. Okay. Uh, and and um, in terms of geographically, do you have a preference? Um, you know, is it more... Europe, more UK, more US, more emerging? Yeah, I mean, I still think that European spreads, you know, are pr probably do point to having a little bit more upside here. Um, right. But like, like in all these situations, there are opportunities in all geographies, and I think it's a question you have to be flexible and look at the relative value of the individual name and uh, rather than just, sort of, you know, from the top down, focus on a geography and then try and find your ones there. I mean, we prefer to sort of, you know, have an open mind about the geography, look on each individual book, high conviction, relative value, I think, and flexibility. That's the name of the game over the course of the next 12 months. Right. Great. Any, any other asset classes that you would then point to as being the all sort of specialist areas that you point to that you, you guys are spending time on? We, we very much like the, um, and it's a very specialist area, but we like the European CLO market. This is, right. these are bonds that are actually backed by leverage loan collateral. Um, there is a complexity premium associated with this type of product. We're quite lucky that we have a team of specialists that look at these all day long, um, and they help us with the with the bond selection in, in, in that particular sector. Um, but when you think about, um, where where rates are, which help the sort of the leveraged loans refinance when they come to their sort of maturity. When you think about the the low default rate, the high recovery rate, 
Um, I think the CLOs, when you compare the spread you get there compared to a plain vanilla bond, I think that there is considerable relative value there. And they're floating rate note as well. So when rates go up, you're yeah. actually protected. You're going to be okay. All right. Well, that's yeah. great. Gary, I really appreciate that. That was hugely interesting. And uh, you know, your, your experience is just uh, shining through. And uh, hopefully that the, uh, the coming months uh, go in everybody's favour and uh, we have a bit of inflation, just not too much of it. Exactly. Darren, okay. all pleasure. Yeah, you take care. Okay, thanks. You too, mate. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching uh, the podcast. Uh, there are other episodes available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, we love feedback. So uh, do send us an email to podcasts at goldrockcap.com. Be well, and thanks, everybody. Bye.